we proudly present the Disney Songbook and the beloved songs and music of Disney legends Richard M. Sherman and Alan Menken.
certain age, like, uh, <laughs> you had a, a crush on that. And I love those old Anthony Cello record albums oh, okay. that had themes. And, and they had the novelty songs on them, like, uh, what was it? Uh, I know the princess. I know the princess. Oh, yes. I know the princess was from an album which we worked on called uh, Hawaiian and One Word. Clever stuff. Hawaiian and, and actually what we did was we, we wrote several songs and then we took some standards and made an album package. And it was a big, big seller. And I'll give you a little bit of Hawaiian and... Uh, no, the, 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 what was it? I know the princess. princess. That's it. I saw a boy on Oahu Island floating down the bay on a crocodile. He waved at me and he swam ashore, and I knew he'd be mine forevermore. Pineapple princess, he calls me pineapple princess all day as he plays a ukulele on the hill of the bay. Pineapple princess, I love you. Girl, I've seen someday you're gonna marry and you'll be my pineapple queen. The next time we did it was a big hit, so they said, do another one. So we did an Italian themed album, and it was called Italian Edge. <laughs> and then we did a third one about dance music, we did Dance in it. And one day the next day, it was, what are you going to do next? Bassinet? And, and kiss, what was it? A kitchenette. And she would go out of the house and then kitchen. But we didn't do any more of those. That was enough of them. When you got the kitchenette, you have to end it. Yeah, you're over. Peanut butter. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about another little uh, teenage idol that you worked with. Her name was Haley Mills. Oh, okay. <laughs> And oh, the trouble with that was we had written some songs for a film called The Barrack Trap. You might know that. And uh, it was, uh, God knows, really a sequence where uh, Haley and Haley, the two Haley's, would sing a duet together called Let's Get Together. It was kind of a subtle, <laughs> uh, subtle hit for the parents to get together. They were a divorced family. So basically, we had this recording session. And Haley was very hesitant. She was very afraid about doing anything. And uh, I re realized that she was not happy. So I said, what's the matter here? And she said, well, I'm an actress. I'm not a singer. And I said, but you are a wonderful actress. Well, she said, thank you. I said, why don't you act like you're a singer? I can do that. I can do that. And she came out with a million seller. Oh, I really think you're swell. Uh -huh. We really ring the bell. Oh, 
world is a carousel of color. Delightful stories. 
with wonderful characters all about the stuff Teddy Bear and his friends. And he wrote this for his little boy, Christopher Robin. Mm. And we had the great honor of being asked to write the, the music for that original Winnie the Pooh series. And so I'll play you uh, the title song, the title of this love. Deep in the hundred acre wood where Christopher Robin plays, you'll find the enchanted neighborhood of Christopher's childhood days. A donkey named Eel is his friend and Kanga and Lou. There's Rabbit and Pigment and there's Sal. But most of all, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Tubby little cubby all stuffed with fluff. He's Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Cut. Now, there was another film that you did 
that I know is one of your personal favorites, and that would be the Jungle Book. Oh, I know. <laughs> And recently, that film has been turned into a, a stage show, a, a highly a client stage show. Oh, so no, far. very exciting. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, Jungle Book was a, a great assignment because, uh, see, your brother Kipling, the great English author, had written a marvelous book called Jungle Book, and it was a very serious, dark story. It had a lot of mysterious things in it and grisly things that took place in the jungle. And Walt fell in love with the storyline, but he didn't like the tone, the attitude of it. And originally there was a series of uh, an entire screenplay created for it, and Walt rejected it out of hand, he didn't like it. But he, he wanted to do the story. So he asked several of us to come into his office one morning, and I remember there were story men there with uh, directors and background people and all, and then we, Bob and I were the songwriters on the staff, so we were there, of course. And he said, how many of you fellows uh, have read Roger Kipling's Jungle Book? And not a hand was raised. It was like being in a school that you didn't do the assignment, you know? <laughs> you couldn't raise your hand. And he, he said, great, I'm glad you didn't do that because I don't want you to read that book. I want to tell you the story. <laughs> and, and he did the greatest storyteller of the last century by far was Walt Disney himself. He told us what he was. And he told, he told us that, that morning how he wanted to see Jungle Book, and he became the different characters. He became Baloo the Bear, he became the King of the, the Apes, and he became all these wonderful characters. And all of a sudden, we were nuts about this story. We had to tell it right. And so, the one of the assignments, he said, take the scariest, grimmest story and have fun with it. Well, Richard, one of the things that we talked about, um, Backstage, actually, you were, you were going on and on and on about how much you love the stage show, this new stage show at the Jungle Book. It's just wonderful. They're taking the score, the original score, plus Terry Gilkinson's song, which I always take vows for, and I didn't write, and that's the bare necessities. It's a great song. The one song we didn't write, the picture, but all the rest of the songs are Bob's and mine. And that score, plus the new additional songs that Bob and I had written for a sequel, plus a few other things, are fattened out into this big stage production. And it looks so great. It's a wonderful live cast. And I'm very excited about it. It'll be touring. I'm sure it'll be coming to the East. But we were talking to you. Yeah. You kind of focused on the Vulture song. Oh, the, yeah. That is one of your favorite songs in the film. And they do it in the play as well. Yeah, now there we were signed to do a, a song that uh, these vultures, you know, vultures, they, they wait till something's dead. Then they eat them. They, you know, they carry it. And uh, it's kind of a grisly thing. So we decided. Let's not do that kind of vultures. We'll have friendly vultures. We'll have vultures that want to be nice. And there's a little, a little bit on Tondra in it. We did it as a, as a barbershop quartet. So you've got to imagine a barbershop quartet with slightly Liverpudlian accents singing this thing. When you're alone, who comes around to pluck you up? When you are down, and when you're outside, That's what friends are for, and who's always here to ascend a friendly claw. That's what friends are for, and when we're lost in dire need, who's at your side? At lightning speed, we're friends with every creature coming down the pipe. In fact, we've never met an animal we didn't like. <laughs> He grunts, he goes, oh, 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 like that a lot. And uh, he also swings in a tree. 
And I remember sitting there, we were talking about what are we going to write for this guy? And as soon as the sword swings in the tree came out and said, he's the king of the swingers, not just the king of the apes, he's the king of the swingers, and he's marauding with monkey friends. They're his, his band. So we, we really got the thing that we cast it with Louis Prima and Sam Pinter and the witnesses, this great group of jazz men, and they were marvelous. And then Phil Harris played Baloo, and so we, we said, we'll have a sequence where Baloo and, and the King of the Apes sing together. And we never could get the two of them together. So that's, that's the story of So actually what happened was, uh, we recorded just Louis Prima and Sam Pinter filled in in one place where they're doing the sketch singing. That's the double talk sound words. And the uh, scooby doo doo booby bang that kind of thing. And we, we just did the, the aping of it. And then that was just scooby doo doo scooby doo doo And Phil Harris, about four months later, when he finally got into the studio, was listening to I can't sing that, that's not my kind of word. I can't do that. Woody Ryan, our director, came out and said, Phil, look, do what you want to do, but just answer. You know, she said, oh, I'll do that. And it became the most hilarious thing you've ever heard. So they're having a conversation in Double Talk. And I, I can't do all of that, but I'll give you an idea of what the song sounds like. Now, I'm the king of the swingers, oh, the jungle of the ID. I reached the top and had to stop, and that's what bothered me. Now, I want to be a man and cook and stroll right into town and be like the other men. I'm tired of walking around and say, ooh, I want to be like you. And send it off to Chevalier. 
Sure enough, he came out of retirement and he sang the main title and the end title of the song in English and French. He was wonderful. My wife and I happened to be in Paris about three and a half, four months after he recorded the song. And we were just coming in the hotel and there he was. Maurice and some people and I said, Maurice Richard Sherman, that was oh yes, I remember the course. I said, well, my brother Bob and I are so thrilled that you did this recording and it sounds so great and everything. Everybody in the studio was excited about it. And he said, well, thank you. He says, I love, love, I love Walt Disney and I did this for Walt Disney. And it's a very nice song. I said, well, thank you so much. And he said, I said, but there's one thing that bothers me. I, I did this terrible, thick, phony French accent on the album, on the record, and I apologize for that. He looked me right in the eye and said, Accent? I heard no accent. <laughs> I like that little padumbo you just said there. <laughs> well, now, how many of you grew up on the film Ben Knobs and Broomstick? Very special to you. And tell us, and it was nominated for an Oscar. Well, tell us about actually, it. Uh, we were at the studio and Walt had passed on, and we were, we were back, we had come back into the studio after being away for a while, and uh, we were asked to do uh, some more songs for Red Knots. They were about to shoot the film and they needed a couple of sequences. And there was one place where a song was needed for the heroine, uh, a given time price, a given time price, to sing. Uh, about a little Dottie Thomas, a little boy who didn't believe in magic, who didn't believe in anything, who was very disenchanted with life. And uh, we were trying to think of what are we going to write about? And we were saying, Walt isn't here anymore, and we used to always bounce our songs off of Walt first, play them for him, and then he'd say, Yeah, that'll work. That was our big praise. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> and then we had it in the film. But in this case, we didn't have any Walt. Disney to tell us. And so we, I remember it was one, one of us said, well, we've got to start depending on ourselves because we've got to believe in ourselves. It's as simple as that. And I said, this little boy was going through the age of not believing. Oh, yeah, but once you start believing in yourself, then you can do things. So we wrote this little song and I'm very fond of it. When you rush around in hopeless circles, searching everywhere for something true, you're at the age of not believing that all the make believe is through. When you set aside your childhood heroes and your dreams are lost upon a shelf, you're at the age of not believing. And worst of all, you doubt yourself. You're a castaway where no one hears you on a barren isle in a lonely sea. Where did all the happy endings go? Where can all the good times be? You must face the age of not believing, doubting everything you ever knew. Until at last you start believing There's something wonderful, truly wonderful in And 
we saw some singular figure, practically empty park, and one figure was walking down the road, looking into the windows of the, of the stores. And I said, well, oh, that's all. I mean, let's, let's tell them how much, how much fun we had tonight. So, so we waited for him to come, and he said, oh, okay, uh, and we were talking for a minute, and I said, well, we just want you to know we had the most wonderful day. It was just incredible. And at the end, when Tinkerbell was flying across the sky, and the music was playing, and the sky rockets were going on, I just started to cry like a lady. Just happy tears, but they were just coming out of my, my eyes. And he said, you know, I do it every time. <laughs> and I just told him, he said, right there, you go home. And he said, I'm going to go home. And I ideally remember that, because he just loved the park. He loved the things in it. He loved what it symbolized. He loved what it meant, you know. There are happy endings. There's a good world out there. Nice, positive things. He was a very positive man. Thank you. This year happens to be the 50th anniversary of the, the very first song you wrote in the park. <laughs> We all had a hobby. We thought it was a hobby. We had a thing he was very proud of. And he used to bring VIPs down to one of the sound stages. And in the corner of this sound stage was a, like a jungle room. And they would come in and they would see this thing that was going on. It was called audio animatronics. You know about them now, but not 50 years ago. And people would see orchids singing and birds, you know, standing on purpose singing, and Tiki torches going, oh, 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 and all of a sudden they were and they would see this show that they were creating for the enchanted Tiki room, and they would say, it, it's great, well, what the heck is it, you know, <laughs> that's what they would say. And so uh, we were called down one day to this room, and we were sitting on bridge chairs, I remember that. And uh, the show started, and down came this cascade of birds singing. That's all sing like the Herbie sing. I remember mean, listening to the sing. And at the end, when, when the rain stopped and everybody was happy again, we said, well, it's great. Well, what is it? <laughs> and he looked right at us and said, you guys are going to write me a song that's going to explain it all. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we said, uh, yeah, OK, well, well you don't have to believe, we're going to write a lyric, you have to believe. It's too bad you don't have a parrot. He thought for about a half a second, he said, we won't have one parrot, we'll have four parrots. We'll have a Dutch parrot, we'll have a German parrot, we'll have a Spanish parrot. He was going through a whole conception, and he said, what kind of song are you to write? So we looked around, and it was kind of a tropical room, as well, a, well, a tropical song of uh, Calypso. So he said, yes, Calypso. And what's it going to be called? Well, Enchanted TV Room is a bit of a another title. It's a great good title for the place, but song title, no. But tiki is a great word. And if you're a songwriter and you hear words like tiki, it's kind of good. And so I remember thinking, tiki, 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 tiki. Yes, it sound tiki, tiki, tiki. Uh, how about we call it the tiki, tiki, tiki room? He says, that's it. When am I going to have a song? <laughs>
And uh, anyhow, he was creating this, this journey into imagination. And he had a fellow called the Gene Finder and a little friend of his called Figment. Now, Figment is a figment of imagination. And we were asked to write a song that would sort of explain what this ride was going to be. It's one of a journey into imagination. And now it's like the Imagineers song, because we all have imaginations. And that's what it's all about. It takes one little spark of imagination to make wonderful things happen. And it starts like this. One little spark of inspiration is at the heart of creation. Right at the start of everything that's new. So, one of the keynote songs for Mary Poppins 
is a song called A Spoonful of Sugar. Right. All right. And in the, uh, in the film, uh, she sings it with a little bird, right. and she sings it again with herself in the mirror. Right. And I think on this song, you might get a little help. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Schwartzman and B.J. Nopal. Oh, 
you may think the sweets on the blossom most rum, though I spent me time in the ashes and smoke. In this whole wide world, there's no happier love. Up with a smoke is all bitter and curled. Between pavement and stars, that's the chimney sweet's world. When there's hardly no day and hardly no night, there's things half in shadows and halfway in light.
Thank you for this. I can that. Well, we could tell them what happened to us when we did that at Disneyland. Oh, we could tell them about that. Walt's 100th birthday, this is about 12 years ago, you had produced a show, and we had a lot of Imagineers came out and did speeches and talked about the projects and things that they created. In the honor of Walt, we were dedicating the wonderful statue by Blaine Gibson of Walt and Mickey. Is that up there? It's coming up. Oh, it's a picture. Where it's a beautiful partner section. And we were dedicating it. And I remember I was asked to do songs to written for the park. Some of the songs to written for the park. So I played several things. And at one point, and there were 2,000 people in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the street that day, in the main street. And I was on another ride there with a white piano. And at one point, I turned around. There was Walt and Mickey right behind me. I said, folks, this next song is not for, for, you, for you. It's really a wonderful Walt. And this was his song, and I used to like to play this with him. And I proceeded to play Feed the Birds. And I got to the very end of it, where it just happens, happens to a little run on the earth. And one bird out of a cloud in the sky comes swooping right down over where I was playing the piano. Right, and then off again. And there was a, an intake of breath, 2,000 people went, like that. And, that was, and then, then there was thunderous applause and everything, and I said, what did, what was the gimmick, what happened? I didn't know there was a bird. <laughs> and I came, came backstage afterwards and I said to Tim, Tim, what happened? And you told me. I said, Walt visited us. Said, Walt visited us. And I, I thought that was a, a great moment. He said, I had to go to the video that happened until I saw the videotape. And there it was, one bird. Down out of the sky. And one time you told the story and you said the bird sat on the piano and waved at me. And I said, that's going to the fault. He did follow over here, he really did. And I always feel Walt is with me and he's with all of us in my school. By, by playing out one of Walt's favorite songs. And, and it's a song that you wrote for Walt for an attraction that shows off Walt's great optimism. Oh, so right. let's close with that. He was the futurist of all time, and we, had been, we did a song for an attraction called Carousel Crockers. <laughs> Thank you.
Can anybody say that? Say, two. I heard this. Don't just tell me it's the Project Cali Rufus. If you can't say it, don't let it be by your tongue. So when the cat is back, you're told it's only for you to say, just sum it up this word, and then you've got a lot to say. Remember, you can care for me, or it can change your life. One night I served to be girl, and now me girls be wife. She's super. I'm a friend of the Super Cali Rufus. Super Cali Rufus.